indeed gathered to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this very much includes those in this sanctuary and those streaming in. Thank you for setting <coughs> this time apart to be a community seeking God's praise. And this is just what the choir has led us into, our lifting up the name of our Lord and our Savior, our Creator and Sustainer in gratitude and in joy. Halle and hallelujah, they have sung. Praise and God be praised. For some of us, the praise of God or others for others comes easily and naturally, and for others of us, we are more perhaps uncomfortable or hesitant and cautious. But let's do our best today. Let's do the work of praising and worshiping God right now. Let us remember the scripture that calls us to praise the Lord of all and believe that God indeed yearns for and inhabits the praise of his people. I invite everyone now to please stand as you are able. And Phyllis Kidd has worked her way front here. When we have the new space, we redo a bit. We're considering having a zip line down from the balcony, but that's, that's yet to be determined yet. But Phyllis leads us in her call to worship. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle of our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. That candle still burns as our hope continues. John the Baptist called on the people of his day to prepare the path for the coming of the Messiah. He called on them to repent, change their ways, and live in peace with others. We are called to do the same. We light this second candle to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He shows us how to share God's peace with others. As we celebrate Advent, let us ask the Lord to make us instruments of his peace, to sow love where there is hatred, pardon where there is injury, faith where there is doubt, hope where there is despair, joy where there is sadness, and light where there is darkness. As we wait in expectation of the celebration of God's ultimate gift of love to all people, may our hearts and lives flicker with the warmth and light of his hope and peace for each one of us. As we light our second Advent candle, we thank you for the peace you give. As we prepare for Christmas time, we pray. Light of the world, shine on us. In our lives of confusion and stress, bring peace to our hearts, to all the people who don't know you, we pray. Light of the world, shine through us. In this world of pain and darkness, help us to share the peace you give. In our service here today, we pray. Light of the world, light the way. Let us continue our worship by singing hymn number two, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
God is gracious and merciful and knows our needs even before they reach our lips. Even so, we engage in confession, admitting to God that uh, admitting to God all that rests uneasily in our hearts. Confident of God's love, let us confess our sins and ask for his forgiveness. Saving God, we are your people, yet the world cannot see this. We are your children and fail to live in peace. We are your voices and choose to be silent. We are your hands and feet and walk a different road. Forgive us for ignoring your love, for brushing aside your hand and trusting our own wisdom. Enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth, to bring to you our joyful songs in the everyday moments of our lives that your name might be glorified through our words and lives. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God so loved the world that God sent Jesus to us, not to condemn the world, but in order that we might be saved, healed, and forgiven through him. Thanks be to God. you to join your hearts with my voice as we move into prayer. Praise be to you, our Lord, the God of all that was and is and ever will be. You sent the Lord Jesus into this world and offered to all people the path of redemption. We celebrate him, the one through whom all things were made, the one in whom was life, and that light was the light of all people the one whose light shines in the darkness and is not overcome by that darkness. You have raised up this gift of salvation and created a way that we might fully serve you wholeheartedly all our days. It's about you and providing the space for your glory to be revealed. Lord, remove the blinders so that your people might have the knowledge of your salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And we know that such a gift is only extended and proclaimed because of your tender mercy, our God. We need that, Lord, and so does our fearful, self-focused culture and planet. Help us not to be about sustaining a lifestyle or a status or a fortress or a kingdom on earth, but about acting justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with you, O oh God. Help us during this giving season to lavish not so much upon those closest to us but to lavish on those with little. We give you thanks for our mission partners today who pour out their hearts for those with little. We pray particularly for several requests from Wyman and their work with young men and women in North Lawndale. We pray along with them for those in their neighborhood suffering from trauma related to gun violence and a recent community mass shooting quite close to them. We thank you for their compassionate response to the migrant crisis in Chicago and their desire to provide tangible support for asylum seekers. We pray with them for those in their community who lack resources during the holidays or have lost loved ones. And we pray your grace on their staff member, Tashwana, as she helps her grandfather in his final stages of life. Lord, bless the hands of Wyman and their good work. We've seen the good that can happen amid the ceasefire in Israel and Palestine, and may that return, and may diplomacy find a way forward. Soften hearts, Lord, in that region, and in Russia, and other areas of great violence and hate. In this season in which we celebrate the Prince of Peace, help us to pray for and advocate for peace. We also lift some needs in this body. We thank you for excellent medical attention and successful surgeries for Tom Tusher and Terry Poppleton in recent days. Bring them rest and your healing grace. 
And Tom, Lord, we lift him before you as he's had a few challenges, and we, we pray that you would encourage him and bring him your grace, Lord. Be with Nancy King in her ongoing hip surgery uh, recovery and with Dave Seehoff as you care for him through his treatment. May each have a clear sense of your presence with them and your gracious love and provision. And we lift ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our world before you in both gratitude and concern. And we thank you, Emmanuel, God with us for the rich prayer that you taught your disciples and us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together now in raising our voices and singing number 14, Savior of the Nations Come. Please stand as we sing. pass the peace, but just it's an opportunity for us to extend uh, what we know that the, the, that the Prince of Peace came into this world and into our lives to extend peace to us and for us to be conduits of that peace, that reconcil reconciliation to other folks. So I'd encourage folks who are online, if you're able to uh, greet the peace, share the peace with those who are with you, or maybe through a text or a comment on Facebook, and for those in this sanctuary space, I encourage you to turn around and engage those you know and those you don't know, saying the peace of the Lord be with you. for extending that peace to one another. 
Uh, kids who are in the service are always a gift to us, and thank you for being here. But if uh, you're welcome to stay, or if you want, you could slip out and head to wonderful children's programs at this time. And we're grateful, too, for those who are guests with us today. We thank you for being in our midst, and we hope that this service is of encouragement and challenge for you and worshipful as well. And after the service, please do engage others around you in conversation and head, if you would, to the Welcome Center at the back for any questions you have there, as well as there's a gift there for you to uh, enjoy as well. At this time, I'd ask the people by the center aisles, if you could, to take the black pad that is there and fill out your information and send it down the row and back again. Name and email is particularly helpful as we seek to keep you engaged and aware of what's happening in the life of this congregation and also to have a sense of who is in our midst. And those who are online and on the church website, I encourage you to uh, click the Connect Card button and fill out information there as well so we know you are there. While you do that, a few announcements for you. We are, of course, in December, and that means four weeks from today is that's Christmas Eve. Yeah, I know it's not Christmas, you know, Christmas Eve, and that means lots of things for, for you, but for this, church, uh, for this church body, it means worship services that we want uh, to invite you to and want you to invite others to as well. And there are five of them, 10 a.m. acoustic, 2 and 3.30 kids and family services, 5.30 modern service, and 8 p.m. classic service. All are wonderful services to prepare and to get the word out about, so please do that. This morning begins a, a wonderful two-week equipped class, Astronomy, Faith, and Wonder. Astronomy, astronomer Dr. Luke Leisman is here, and as I said last week, I heard him speak at River City Church in Chicago this summer, and he was deeply encouraging and passionate uh, both about the universe and his faith. So you will be encouraged, I guarantee it, uh, but only if you come to the class at 10 a.m. It's, uh, it's today and next week, and then you head down that way to the parlor. Please attend that. And speaking of equipped tonight at 4 p.m. is uh, movie night. Uh, please do come to engage with some community as we grow together in our discipleship with Christ as we are challenged to understand and confront racism. You can still register online for this evening. Outreach Community Center has its Outreach Christmas store this coming Saturday. The uh, hats and gifts we have been collecting are for that. Now good news, Kristen Simon says that we are in good shape now with the hats, but you can still buy a gift for the Christmas store by uh, taking an ornament from the tree, the, the couple trees that are around, uh, take the ornament and that has instructions on purchasing a gift, but they were... Um, that, but they were actually supposed to be, the gifts were supposed to be in today, so, you know, keep that in mind. The other need is for volunteers this coming Saturday for the Outreach Christmas Store event. Uh, they need volunteers to help with that, and you can sign up online. And uh, then today we have cards. Chris will remind us again at the end, we have cards to go with those gifts to be signed. And please just go right to those tables and sign a few cards, write a little note, that kind of thing. Um, encourage you to do that, please. There are many more announcements in your bulletin, uh, and you can register for various things online as well. Speaking of presence, as we come now to present uh, our gifts to God, um, consider this strong challenge for us from the Apostle Paul to Timothy in his pastoring of the flock. Um, Paul wrote these words. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. May we be so challenged by God's word, whether we give right now or in the days ahead. Those online and on the church website are welcome to use the How to Give button, or any of us may give through text. And at this time, I invite the ushers to come in the sanctuary to receive the offering as the choir sings the very Advent-themed, We Wait for God.
in our Christmas sermon series this morning entitled, Come Home, God's Christmas Invitation. And if you were with us last week, you remember that this Christmas season, our goal as a community really is to make sure that we feel the weight and the power of what is happening in the event of Christmas. And in order to do that, we're going to be looking at some passages in Scripture that are not the Christmas story itself, but that help us better understand, better see, better feel what's happening in the event of Christmas. God taking on flesh in order to bring his people home to him. Last week, we talked a little bit about the danger of the familiar the reality that when, when things are very well known for us, we can take them uh, for granted, we can filter them out, we can just kind of zip through them on cruise control. If you uh, go to a Blackhawks game and you sing the national anthem, you may or may not be thinking about what the lyrics mean. It's just so familiar to you. When I lived in Seattle, the mountains were always, always there. And there would be some days I'd see them and go, wow. And some days I'd just be in traffic, man, man, get out of the way. You know, they're always there. I, I just didn't always see them and, and feel their beauty. Same thing is true of the Christmas story. We know the story. We know the songs. And it's possible for us to just move through the Christmas season and never feel the impact of the message, the good news. I want to show you a couple examples from Christmas carols of lyrics that are we will sing them this year, and they are absolutely powerful. But because we know the tune, we know the lyrics, I don't know that we always feel the weight of what we're singing. Here's one from Angels We Have Heard on High. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joy joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be? Which inspire your heavenly songs? These are actually really powerful questions. And we can just sort of stop the hymn at that moment and let's answer that. Qu it's not a rhetorical question. <clears throat> what is going on that causes the shepherds to react the way they do, to burst forth with joy and song and to leave everything and run to the major? It's a genuinely important question. Here's another lyric that I don't know we always capture the power of when we say it together. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the sky. So we are singing that the entire earth should rise to its feet in joy because of something that's happening in Christmas, that God and sinners are being reconciled as God takes on flesh. It's not just a baby that's born to us. It's a savior. A savior. And what we're going to look at today is what it means for us to come home to our savior. Last week we looked at what does it mean to come home to the love of our heavenly father. This week we're going to look at what does it mean for us to come home to our savior. But before we do that, let's pray. Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, may we know reality this morning. May we know the reality of our deep need. May we know the reality of your lavish love for us. May, may we know the reality of the gift of Christmas. We ask that you would be our teacher and that the good news would come this morning. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture passage today comes from the book of Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. This is God's word for you, and it's God's word for me today. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, Christmas, Christmas, the fact that the eternal God became physical, 
tells us that this reconciliation that God is accomplishing, this reconciliation is not just going to help you individually, and it's not just going to help you spiritually, but that in, in Jesus Christ, who took on flesh, God is reconciling everything. There's a whole idea behind Christmas that God would become flesh and permanently inhabit a human body means that God will someday reconcile the physical and the spiritual, whether things on earth or things on heaven, and the relational. What's happening in Christmas is that the unclean is becoming clean. The broken is becoming whole. And the way this is happening is that God is entering physically into the brokenness himself to take on the infection of sin and death into himself. Now, that sounds pretty ethereal and conceptual. And so I want to show you a picture of this from Jesus' ministry. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has been, um, he's been teaching, he's been healing, and word has begun to spread about Jesus, and this large crowd has gathered round. And in the midst of this scene, a, a particular leader of a local synagogue approaches Jesus, and he says, hey, I need your help. My daughter is at home, and she's dying. Will you come with me to see her? This man's name is Jarius. And Jesus agrees, and so he turns and he goes with Jarius to visit his daughter in his home, and the crowd goes with him. And as they're making their way, a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years approaches Jesus from behind and she touches him, feeling that if I touch Jesus, I will be healed. Now, something that may not be immediately evident, but it's important, is that if you were bleeding in that culture, you were forbidden from entering the holy places of the temple because you were ritually unclean. And you can read in Leviticus all sorts of, of rules about what made a person clean or unclean. For instance, um, if you touched a dead person, you were unclean for a certain period of time. And in a similar way, if you were bleeding or if you touch someone who was bleeding, that made you unclean. So this woman, who'd been bleeding for 12 years, had not been into the presence of God in the temple. She couldn't go. She was unclean. Spiritually, physically, she was broken. And Mark tells us, that, listen, this woman's been to many doctors. She's been working on this. These doctors tried to help her, but the bleeding just got worse and worse over time. So for over a decade, which likely constituted most of her adult life, she had been unclean. Unclean according to the religious law. She had seen herself as unclean. She was seen by others as unclean. And it's really interesting, in the scene, uh, both Jarius, the synagogue leader, and this unclean woman, both of them are really in touch with their need. I, I need Jesus. But Jarius, the synagogue leader, walks right up to Jesus. Jesus, I need your help. This unclean woman, by contrast, sneaks around behind Jesus. She doesn't even talk to Jesus. She doesn't have the same sense of, of worthiness that Jairus has. She just reaches out and places her hands upon Jesus. Now, in the Jewish tradition, there were uh, two different rituals that symbolized the removal of sin. One was to uh, confess your sins, place your hands on a goat without, without physical defect, and then drive the goat out of the community to a solitary place. That's where we get the term scapegoat. The symbol is one of the uncleanliness of sin for the person or the community, 
being transferred onto the animal by the laying of hands, a perfect spotless animal. And that represents what is clean becoming unclean and what was unclean becomes clean, is cleansed of its sin. That was one ritual. Another ritual also involved an animal without defect, like a perfect animal, and it also involved the laying on of hands. So same symbolism here of, of transferring the guilt of sin from the person or the community to the animal. But in this ritual, the animal was then slaughtered. So the idea here is that uh, because of my sin, because of our sin, I am unworthy of, of God's judgment, what I'm, of God's love rather, what I really have earned through sin is God's judgment and death. This animal stands in my place, my uncleanness transferred onto the spotless animal, and then the animal is sacrificed. Now in Mark 5, an unclean woman comes and touches Jesus. And when that happens, Jesus stops and he turns around and he says, who touched me? There's a moment of comedy here in the gospel because the disciples look at Jesus and say, Jesus, what, what are you asking? There is a massive group of people here. We're all trying to get to Jairus' house. Why are you asking who, like who didn't touch you, Jesus? And, and Jesus just persists. Mark says, Jesus was aware that his power had gone out of him. And so he continues asking, no, who was it who touched me? And this unclean woman comes forward. She emerges from the crowd. She falls at her feet. And Jesus says to her, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. You have been freed from your suffering. Now, in one sense, this is just another of the many, many healings and miracles that Jesus performed. But in another sense, we get a picture here of what is happening in Christmas. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians, God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Because here you have this unclean woman seeking physical healing and reconciliation to God by physically touching the body of Jesus. And in the same way that the priest would lay his hands on the goat, symbolizing that the sinner who was unclean would become clean. And that which was clean would become unclean. So this woman, this woman who was both physically unwell and spiritually unclean becomes both clean and healed because she laid her hands on God incarnate. The fullness of God. Or to make it a bit more literal, her bleeding stops, but only because Jesus' bleeding is about to begin. And part of what I want us to realize in Christmas is that the invitation God extends for us to come home is not just an invitation for us to come home to our buddy Jesus, but to come home to our Savior. Paul says in Colossians, that's what this event is all about. That is why God was pleased to have all of God's fullness dwell in the person of Jesus Christ so that God and sinners could be reconciled. That's why the shepherds have joy. That's why this whole event is worth celebrating. That's why we give gifts. Because we, the unclean, 
are being given the gift of forgiveness and righteousness and healing through God made man. We are being given a savior. Now this one who has come as a physical person, as a vulnerable child, this one who will die a sinner's death has come so that every one of us who recognizes our need for a savior can come home. At, uh, at Christmas time, we have a, a bunch of stories where non-human characters are humanized, right? So you got Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He's a reindeer, but he's getting bullied. He's getting picked on just like other kids. And so he uh, kind of becomes a, a human-like character. Uh, the Grinch, not a human but he's kind of human-like, he's uh, jealous, he's bitter, he's uh, envious, right? He's got a dog, he's got a lot going on for the Grinch that's like a human. Frosty the Snowman, not a human, but magically he becomes like a human. That's kind of a, a theme that gets present in these Christmas stories. You'll also see people do that a lot with the animals that are in the Christmas story itself, the animals that are in the gospel. They'll kind of make them all have human characteristics. There's a, a really famous poem called The Friendly Beasts. And the poet talks about all the gifts that the animals gave to Jesus in, on the night of his birth. So uh, the donkey loves Jesus, and uh, he carried Mary on her long journey to the stable. Um, there was the cow who donated his manger. There you go, Jesus. I'll do you a solid. You can borrow that. Uh, the sheep who gives up his wool for swaddling clothes. That seems a little immediate to me, but it's a poem. Okay. The whole thing is about the gifts of the animals, making them like people, and the gifts that we give to, to Jesus. And uh, you, know, you think of other examples of the little drummer boy, or it just kind of becomes about, oh, there's Jesus. Let's give him gifts. C.S. Lewis uh, looked at the manger scene and he had a very different take on it. Lewis essentially uh, shows us that rather looking at the animals in the manger scene and making the animals human-like, perhaps it would be more fitting if we looked at the animals in the manger scene and we saw ourselves in the animals. This is Lewis' poem entitled The Nativity. Among the oxen, like an ox, I'm slow. I see a glory in the stable grow, which with the ox's dullness might at length give me an ox's strength. Among the asses, stubborn I as they, I see my savior where I looked for hay. So may my little beast-like folly learn at least the patience of a beast. Among the sheep, I like a sheep have strayed. I watch the manger where my Lord is laid. Oh, that my buying nature would, would win thence some woolly innocence. What I like about what Lewis does here is he really captures the spirit of the Christmas season because in Christmas, we are being given a gift by God, a savior. We're being given the grace that we need. God's grace has entered the world in a very humble way. And here's the thing, we need it. We don't need advice. We don't need encouragement. We need a savior. And that's why it's not the gifts that we give, but the gift that we are given that makes Christmas significant. The good news of Christmas is not, is not that 
you know, goodwill and, and Christmas cheer among human beings is such that we will all now start being nice to each other. And that will fix the world's problems. The good news of Christmas is that through our collective effort, we could never accomplish that kind of peace, that kind of justice, that kind of reconciliation. We need a Savior. And God is doing for us in Jesus Christ what we could never do for ourselves. Our work is to come to Christmas ready to receive what we need. We are being given a Savior. It's a gift that can cause joy in us, but in order for it to do so, we have to be familiar with our need. Our Lord Jesus Christ, at the end of his time with his disciples, he gathered with them around a table. And Jesus had taught a lot about, uh, about bread in his ministry. He had uh, fed the 5,000. He talked about be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees. This was not a new uh, image for them that Jesus would take bread and make it significant. One of the things Jesus had told them in the Sermon on the Mount was this. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness. He didn't say blessed are those who are full of righteousness. Blessed are those who are, <clears throat> are well satisfied with their righteousness. He was saying blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness. In other words, <clears throat> if you think you're close, if you think you're like, I'm really close to, to being who I want to be and, and having God's approval, then you're so far off. But if you think you're far off, if you understand the depth of your need for God's righteousness, then you're really close. The woman in Mark 5 who comes to Jesus, she comes hungry and thirsty. She wants to be healed physically. She wants to be cleansed spiritually. And so at this table, Jesus extends an invitation to everyone, everyone who has placed their faith in him and who is truly sorry for their sin. And he says to us, if you want God's grace, come home. Come hungry. Come thirsty. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed by one of his own disciples, he took bread. And after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul reminds us, church, as often as we eat this bread, and as often as we drink from this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that um, you would illuminate the dark parts of our hearts. That all the, the places that, that we want to hide from you, all the things that we know, I'm just, I'm just not quite there yet, that you would shine your light in all of those places and that you would convince us that you want to build your kingdom right there. And that all we need to do is to come to you and to receive from you what you want to give us. So Lord, like this uh, woman in Mark 5 who understood the depth of her need and who sought out you for what you were able to give to her, I pray that we as a community would come today with joy 
and with a longing to touch and to be touched by you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, This table does not belong to any one church. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And every one of you who has placed your faith in him and is truly sorry for your sin is invited to it today. Uh, We'll receive communion by intinction. Just come forward, take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, receive the sacrament, or turn to your seat by the outside aisle. All the bread is gluten-free, so if that's an issue for you, please just come. If uh, there will be a roving group of elders, if you need the elements brought to you, just put your hand up and they will come and find you. Those of you who are participating online, we trust that you have the elements ready there and that you will participate uh, with this community as well. If the elders would please come forward.
So we've heard a lot these last few weeks about the Outreach Christmas Store. It's a, a special one-day event that's held each December for families living near Outreach in Carroll Stream. Qualifying families can come. They can affordably shop for Christmas gifts for their children at a savings of 75% of what they would pay in stores. After they shop for gifts, all the families who participate uh, receive a pair of gloves and a winter hat. You all have brought together a thousand winter hats over these last weeks. That is awesome. One thing you can do today is to stop by in the gathering place and fill out two, three, four, five uh, cards. We're going to put a, a card wishing folks Merry Christmas from First Pres to be passed out at the event of the Christmas store on the night. So please take a little bit. If you've got a uh, young person who's learning how to write, you can invite them uh, to do one. This is something that we can all do so that as the folks come through the Christmas store, they get some warmth in the gloves and hats and some warmth in the cards from First Press. Now receive the benediction. May the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the abundant love of God, our Heavenly Father, and may the presence of and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.